Two pastors, a priest, and a couple of Unitarians walk into a musical theater. Hi, I'm Father Andrew Miller. And I'm Reverend Michelle Byerly. And this is A Pastor and a Priest Walk Into a Movie Theater, a podcast about faith, life, and the silver screen. Today we'll be discussing the musical Come From Away. We are excited about this pick. Um, this is one that our music lover resident, uh, Gail Gallagher, has selected for us. And we also have a special guest with us. So would you both say hello? Gail first. Awesome. Hi, everybody. I'm Gail Gallagher. You know me. I host uh, Faith in What Resonates. And Come From Away is one of my favorite musicals. And I have so many feelings. We also have another guest with us. Would you care to introduce yourself? Is that me? It would be you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Laurie Morrison, and I am Wesley Morrison Sloat's mother, and I am formerly a United Methodist pastor. I currently um, am a UCC member, United Church of Christ, and I am a technical writer. I write technical documents for a company for um, call center agents. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm also here, Editor Wesley, but uh, Laura, my mom, Lori, is here because she did a $50 donation for our Indiegogo for New Faith, New Year, New Faith, New Media. So she got to join us for an episode and she watched Come From Away with us, with me, and she loved it. So she decided she wanted to jump in with us for this one because she's all where she is the source of my love of theater. Well, we are to have her join us for this episode. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we are so excited to have everybody here to discuss this beautiful thing. It seems like theater is about community and gathering together. And so it's fun to get together and, and do that. So, Gail, would you talk a little bit about um, what drew you to this musical and why why you picked it for us? Absolutely. Uh, so come from away, uh, which first of all, if you're y'all are like, but where can I watch it? Uh, they recently uh, put it out on Apple TV um, on uh, September 11th uh, in uh, 2021. And um, so it's a pro shot of the stage musical uh, with most of the original cast. And come from away is a musical about uh, Gander Newfoundland on uh, 9-11. So uh, basically what happened is uh, when 9-11 happened, a bunch of planes were diverted to Gander, Newfoundland, uh, you know, because because uh, U.S. airspace was closed. And this town basically doubled population and 7,000 people uh, were, uh, uh, were suddenly in this town and this town hosted them and um, it's just this absolutely beautiful story. And what I love about this show is that it is all first source. Uh, the playwrights traveled to Gander, Newfoundland on the 10th anniversary, and they interviewed people and collected interviews and made this story. And um, and I have dived deep, my friends. There is an episode of uh, this podcast called Broadway Backstory that talks about the making of uh, Come From Away. And um, one of the things that they talk about is the actual mayor of Gander, Newfoundland being like, well, I don't understand how you can write a musical about giving people a bunch of sandwiches and a hug. Um, <laughs> and like they didn't understand because they're like, well, it's we did the thing that you do when people are in need. And what I you know, and so they were being like very like humble about it um, anyway. But what draws me to this musical? Um, I well, first of all, it slaps, as the kids say. Um, it is very, um, <laughs> it is very uh, based in the like the musical culture of Newfoundland, which is very like Irish adjacent, and so it, it has this very triple meter all day long. Like the, it's like the engine of the musical, and um, it's in the style they wanted to pay tribute to um, what's called kitchen parties, which is where. Um, when you are covered in snow in Newfoundland, you dig out enough space so that you can travel from your kitchen to your friend's kitchen, and then you go get drunk and play music and party in the kitchen. So it's telling the story of that town as if it were this kitchen party. So that's part of it. And also, um, yeah, it's the momentum of the show. It's the fact that it's first source. It's the fact that it is... Um, 
based in it's that it's a docudrama uh play and it's very much in the style of like the um like the laramie project or uh any shows where it's like i am a person saying things that an actual person said and it's very presentational but it has this heartbeat to it so it's not as dry as those plays were um which i did a lot of those in college so it's just very cool to be like oh you made that work so there's that and then also the third reason why, or uh, many reasons why, but another reason I, w I love this is Captain Beverly Bass. Um, yes. Um, which we can talk about her character and go into that. Um, but uh, I want to play her. Uh, Jen Collette, who plays her, is amazing. And, what I, and she has an I Want song that is one in a, a regular time signature, which is my heart but also um yeah her story is so powerful and um in the broadway backstory episode they talk about how um that vast was interviewed for um for the the project and like you know years passed and she was like okay whatever hope those kids had fun making musical whatever and then found out as she came to see the musical that she, her character was such a huge role and like saw me in the sky, you know, not knowing that there, that song existed and like felt incredibly seen. And I just, yes. Um, so that is, I guess my general brain thoughts. We can all have a conversation now, but <laughs> I have been let loose. Um, <laughs> um, release it, the Gallagher. <laughs> <laughs> during the first, only no sledgehammers and watermelons, please. Yeah, no. Uh, that but kind of during, the, <laughs> <laughs> during the first quarter, this is where of the of the show. This is where I would have inter interrupted with the the stinger music. But now I'm just going to ask you, what is a regular a regular time signature, and why do you love it? Um, because it it. It has this driving force to it. So a regular time signature, so the one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, or any or I guess triple meter is more confident. So da 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 da. Um and I it just it has a very good engine to it. Um short answer, I listened to a lot of prog rock in college and it's how it's how my soul works. <laughs> so this is the second um, episode of A Pastor and a Priest that we've done on September 11th. We did an episode on the anniversary of September, the 20th anniversary of September 11th, about three films, um, World Trade Center, uh, United 93, and uh, uh, in Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close. And I really wish that we'd have done this one, uh, because it, it seems to me that our conversation and that on that in that episode was quite hopeless at least from a political perspective that that and it, it 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 was right in after the fall of Kabul Afghanistan so it seemed as if the war that began as a result of September 11th was lost and so um the reflections the political reflections in that episode were quite dark and it seems to me that this musical really offers if we could find a way to create a politics of hospitality a way out of madness mm. I think for me, that was the biggest thing of this musical is the juxtaposition of, you know, even in the midst of this tragedy, there is also great beauty, there is opportunity for hope. And to me, that's a very, very holy moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And mom, while we, and I, while we were talking about it, we talked, while we were watching it, we talked about that. What were some of the stuff you said? Well, I was just thinking, you know, we think of a, a very biblical idea of hospitality and making room for the stranger and the people in Gander really did that. And the folks that were on the planes had real trouble with that at first, accepting it. And all the, you know, all the way through, I like, um, they're going to steal my wallet, right? They're going <laughs> to yeah. steal my wallet or I'm going to get in trouble for taking the grills or anything yeah. like that. And instead um, I get offered a cup of tea at every tea. single yeah. house. <laughs> right, right. And it's so hard for them to accept it, but then they eventually fall into it and become part of the community. But then they get back on the plane and they kind of revert back to 
the way things were as they're heading back home, some of them do anyway. And you think about the way things are now and how difficult it is for us to be hospitable like that. Mm-hmm. We, we have a really hard time be, being hospitable to the stranger as a country. Um, that's not the way our uh, certain people, let me say, in our country want to be, don't want to be hospitable to the stranger. And it's very sad because people were very hospitable to us. And it makes me very sad. Mm. Another the- thing we were talking about with hospitable with hospitality was that the um, and I'd been watch I've been watching uh, the Great North, which is by the same people who do Bob's Burgers. Um, and you guys were talking about other shows set in Canada or Alaska before we started recording. But mom and I were talking about in in the Bible and in the Quran and in a lot of Celtic folklore, and that includes Ireland and the, the settlers in Newfoundland, the white settlers were mostly from Ireland. So that's where a lot of this culture is from. And in Native American, basically any culture that's on the edge of the wilderness or is in the wilderness, hospitality is necessary because without hospitality, you die. In the wilderness, if you if you walk up to somebody and say, I am a traveler, I'm a wanderer, I am a refugee, and they don't welcome you in, you die. And if you are not hospitable to someone, then the people around you are going to hear about that, and they aren't going to be hospitable to you. In the wilderness or on the edge of the wilderness, hospitality isn't just to be nice, it's a survival mechanism. Yeah. Like uh, the reality of having a kitchen party is you had to dig out the snow to get to each other's house. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I read a series of books by Louise Penny called the, They're the Three Pines Mysteries. And they're always helping each other out there in, in, Canada, in Canada set in these small village in in Canada and they're always having to dig to each other's houses and dig out around the village and going to uh, somebody's kitchen to gather together and in the midst of winter and it's the same idea whoops sorry that was the cat Um, and it's just that beautiful idea of hospitality for one another. Hmm. NPR did a um uh an episode i don't remember which show it was but they 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 did uh one of the shows did an episode on a study that was um done um on people playing monopoly and uh the gist of it was is that they rigged the game to where it was certain that certain people playing the game would win and other people playing the game would lose but the people and when they and 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 the players were even told that the game was rigged and yet when asked why do you think that you won this game almost invariably the players would start talking about all of the things that they did right all of the skills that they had all of the and and the point being that um even when in the face of the obvious the the ego still comes to 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 bear the the the, the um the, there's this attempt to self justify now where i'm going with that is um that has been cross applied to other studies that have demonstrated that in wealthier cultures and in cultures as you were saying wesley that are not on the edge of the wilderness that in fact there is less generosity <laughs> We often hear so many great things about philanthropy and such, but actually the you know people who contribute the greatest amount of their wealth, of the wealth that they have to spare uh, to caring for others are those people who are less advantaged and those people who are on the, the in the hinterlands in the wilderness, so to speak. So there's a there's a book uh, called A Paradise Built in Hell by Rebecca Solnit. Um, and it is all studies on how people um, help each other out in different disaster situations. And it sort of follows all the way from like 
the uh, San Francisco earthquake at the early 1900s to like, uh, and they talk about 9-11 and they, and, and uh, other, other periods in time, but just really exploring this idea that yes, in disaster situations, there is this fight or flight, but there's also this other nature of uh, what she calls attend and befriend, you know, and, um, and exploring that. Um, and, it is interesting. I think about that book a lot because it came out in like, like I read it in like 2016, 2017. And now I'm like, hey, Rebecca, you're going to do a chapter about this pandemic? Like, <laughs> you know, like, I wonder if she revises it. But, but yeah, it is, it is interesting to look at like the little utopias that sort of pop up mm -hmm. in these disaster situations and think about what causes it. Well, another thing that is interesting, I actually just like either yesterday or today read an article on CNN, I think that basically said that America is very good at short term immediate mm. crises. We are yes. not as good about dealing with the long term chronic emergencies. Mm -hmm. Right. And so well, I. And that's, that's another thing we talked about. Um, and we, the three of us, or the four of us, the board members have talked about it before, is that uh, acute versus chronic trauma response. America, from a place of wealth and prosperity, we're really good at acute, but we're not good at chronic. And uh, so like right after 9-11, we were really good at coming together. We were really good at the acute, but then we didn't change. And here's the cat who was just upstairs annoying mom. Um, but we weren't good at the chronic of changing the systems that led to it. Like uh, the, bi the big example being uh, blood banks. Uh, right after September 11th was the first time in American history that we had a surplus of blood. And so far the only time. It did not lead to a change in people's practices of donating more blood. And it didn't lead to a change in the laws against people, against gay men donating blood if they've had sex within the last year. The, the same with the pandemic. Now, um, initially there, there was a somewhat good response to the pandemic because people thought it was an acute situation. But then as people realized it was a chronic situation, the response quickly trailed off. The, one of the most common definitions in political science and political philosophy for what a state is, is the political body that has the monopoly on authority to do violence. And what if we changed that to the political body that is optimized to do the most kindness, hmm. to be the most hospitable? Don't chew on my microphone. <laughs> yeah. There's a difference between Sorry. social contract. So liberal society, and I mean that broadly defined, not liberal as in the Democratic Party, but broadly defined liberal society, the United States, Canada, and Western Europe, mm -hmm. et cetera, uh, is I think the foundation of its philosophy would be the theory of the social contract, the idea that people contract to live together outside of or out of mutual self-interest. And uh, there's, there are definitely things that can be said for that, but um, the kingdom, what, what Christians call the kingdom, right, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the, the, the post-apocalyptic society, and I mean that in the, the Christian sense, not in the, oh my God, everything's going to hell sense, um, is based upon an idea of social covenant, now, the difference between a contract and a covenant is, is that contracts are based on mutual self-interest. I agree not to uh, 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 mess with your stuff if you agree not to mess with my stuff, and we'll work together to prevent others from messing with each other's stuff, right? Whereas a social covenant is based on mutual other interest, other interestedness. It's not to the exclusion of self-interestedness, but it is other interested in the sense of we will, we will agree to act because we care for one another. So, and covenant implies a relationship in a, in a different sort of way than a contract does. Mm. Certainly, there is a relationship within a contract, but covenant, it seems like the focus is the relationship more than the agreement. 
Yes, and the people of Gander acted as I observed them in the musical, and I, I wasn't there on September 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th of 2001, but as I observed them in the musical, of course, it seemed as if they were acting out of a, a covenantarian desire to do good. I mean, it, I, I didn't catch that there were there was anything compelling to be hospitable or compelling them to be hospitable they chose to be hospitable mm -hmm. perhaps right. the worst that you could say for them is that they were acting out of a sense of obligation mm -hmm. as but but even then it, it, it still the results were the same they there they were they felt obligated to care and they did care mm -hmm. uh, and yeah but like that that scene at the tim hortons where they and I and part of the I love the style of the show, but and we'll get back to that in a second. But that scene at the Tim Hortons where the mayor and the town council were together and someone was and they're they're panicking a little bit and someone finally says, Can we do this? And they all stop for a moment. And the mayor looks around and goes, It doesn't matter if we can do this, we have to. And then mm. they just got to work. Yeah. And and knowing and like pinpointing that cultural difference of of it being an obligation really says like why the people of Gander were like, good luck making that a musical. And like Americans are like, oh, my God, people are being nice to each other. Um, <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. And that that um, the, uh, one of the Kevins, because there's the, the couple. The, oh, the I want to talk about the Kevins. Kevin Kevin. They're a study. But yes, but the, on. the one of the. One of the Kevins had that moment on September 12th where he was in a coffee shop or a, or a gas station or something. And there was the moment of the minute of silence and everybody stopped inside, outside, everybody stopped. People were walking across the street. People were driving down the street and everybody stopped and he looked around and he didn't know what was going on for a second. And then he realized what was happening and he thought to himself, and he's saying this, his little monologue to the audience. And he goes, if I had been in the United States and this attack had happened in Canada and the prime minister of Canada had called for a minute of silence, would an American town have stopped? Mm. Yeah, that was one of the moments that choked me up in the musical mm. was was that exact realization. Mm. One moment on September 11th, and I have a bit of a, um, how shall I say, a sketchy relationship with patriotism. Uh, I, Complex. There, yes, <laughs> thank you. That's a good way to put it. But the one moment on September 11th, 2001, that chokes me up uh, that I, I occasionally will randomly watch on YouTube is when the Queen's guards at Buckingham Palace played the Star Spangled Banner on September 11th. And there are a bunch of American expats gathered around the gates to hear the Queen's guards play the Star Spangled Banner. And uh, the, the Prime Minister, Tony, at the time, Tony Blair, is standing with his hand over his heart. And that, that brought me to tears. The, the moment, the first of many moments in, that, in the musical that gave me goosebumps mm. was the, the scene where they, so many different people were praying there were two yes. women davening. There was the the rabbi and the Jew who had fled as a boy, fled the Holoc the Shoah to Newfoundland and had never told anybody he was a Jew and he came to talk to the rabbi. Mm -hmm. There was the Muslim guy uh, doing the daily prayers. There were the two Catholic women, that, that same Kevin singing that same chorus mm -hmm. of the hymn over and over again. And it was, they, they were, they all had profoundly different faiths, but they were praying together. Mm. Yes. That, that is my favorite, favorite scene. Did Not we talk me. about Franciscan theology then? Yeah, go do it to <laughs> it. Go for it. But I'm not a Franciscan. <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> close enough. <laughs> well, I mean, it is, is, is anybody entirely not a Franciscan? I would hope not. <laughs> uh, I would hope that all of us have some Franciscan in us. But, oh, yeah. uh, you know, the idea of being told by your father, no, you 
you you can't live this ideal life that you've been called by God to live. So you strip down naked and 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 walk out of town smiling and singing and praising God. And then you turn to the to the to the birds and and the wolves and the and 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 and, and preach to them about how much God loves them as well. Um, to to f the idea of finding God in, in places that are least expected. But the prayer of, the, the hymn that they're singing is the prayer of St. Francis, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace where there is hatred, let me so love, where there is injury, pardon, where there is doubt, faith, where there is despair, hope. And um, the, 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 the centerpiece of the prayer is the, pray, the prayer against the ego, the prayer against the basis of the contract that leads us into selfish politics which is, you know, grant that I may not so much seek to be loved as to love, to be understood, as to understand, to be... Um... To, to be served as to serve. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, and, and for me, um, that prayer has been resonating. I, so, of course, we just started the Olympics. But to me, there's this juxtaposition right now. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> this irony between... You know, we have the Olympics that are just starting with their, you know, the, the charter, the United Nations signed the Olympic truce. And yet right now we have troops that are sitting right around the Ukraine. Um, and, and there was a lot of talk about the, the games being held in Beijing and, and all of, so it seems like for being a time of peace, there's also this tension that's always surrounded the Olympics. And when I think about that prayer, what, what it all comes down to is this for me, what does it truly mean to be a person of peace and to live as a peacemaker in the world? You know, um, because it's one thing to say, oh, I'm going to be a good person or a kind person. But when it comes down to it, what I've recognized is I make war on myself all the time, you know, with the way that I talk to myself about things, with the way that I'm not always the nicest to myself. Um, and so, you know, that the song of, you know, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me first. I love this musical in the way that it invites us to consider ways of being peacemakers and that sometimes it is simply being in relationship with other people, making a sandwich for someone, um, you know, doing that thing that everyone else says is a, Oh, that's an amazing thing. And you're like, why wouldn't I do this? So, so that kind of reminds me of something I wanted to talk about. And that is the way this whole thing is staged. I know this sounds weird, but part of what I kept seeing during all of this, it had very simple staging and I kept seeing, oh, this is just chairs and it's that revolving stage and it's so simple. But what they kept doing was taking it apart and putting it back together. They kept, Ooh, and that's what yeah. we're doing all the time. And, you know, they, they would move a chair here or they would move a chair there or they would move it all around or they would revolve the stage. They took it apart and put it back together over and over and over and over again. And the characters kept putting, taking themselves apart and putting themselves back together. And that is what we're doing all the time, too. And like you were saying, Michelle, you know, when you have to talk to yourself and take yourself apart and put yourself back together. And that happened on 9-11 as well. We were taken apart and we had to put ourselves back together. And I yeah. think we forget that that has to happen repeatedly and repeatedly. Mm -hmm. um, my very first college experience, I was a theater major. And I, my big thing was directing and stage management and how it all worked together on the stage. And I forget that too that it's all about how it all moves together and how it all works together and how it, how it interacts with each other and comes together. And then the next time you have to do it all over again. And the next time you have to do it all over again. And every time it happens over and over and over again. And to me that watching that movement on the stage, I, it was brilliant. It was just brilliant. Yeah, I. Oh my goodness. That I I wanted to, I had things I wanted to say about the staging too, but the the taking it apart and putting it back together 
like that I love that you caught that because that is like something I hadn't thought about. What I think is cool in the ensemble element of them, every person plays both a, a member of the town as well as one of the plain people and they're able to shift between and it just really like the the fact that you're embodying all these different people is like sort of part of this exercise of empathy and also yes, yes. and exactly. also this like communal devotion to telling this story like right. it's not right. about any one actor uh it is uh, about the story yeah <laughs> and the collective right. uh, like that the uh the changing the stage changing the scene is done by actors who aren't involved in that scene they they pick up tables or chairs and move them and the the quick change of the uh costumes is done similarly by other actors on the stage who aren't directly involved in that scene like one somebody will take will reach up to the shoulders of someone talking and pull the jacket off Mm. of someone talking and that in that moment the person talking goes from one character to another character. and in the in the broadway backstory episode one of the actors says that in they experienced um in the moment where like looking at you know there somebody who was playing another character previously and like acting with that same person and being like oh their eyes shift like <laughs> yeah wow yeah, yeah. Their whole body language shifted. It, it felt like they would get a couple of inches taller or shorter just by having a jacket taken off or put on. Problem is that we don't want to take ourselves apart. We, we want to hold this unsustainable version of ourselves together that can't be held together. Mm -hmm. And I think there's another... Well, it's scary. Mm -hmm. yes, you know, it's it scary, scary to lose yourself. Yeah. You know, because you're saying I'm going to give myself up there's and, another... and lose who I am. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, well, well, there's another word. <laughs> Andrew, talk. <laughs> there's another word for uh, taking yourself apart, and it's called repentance. And mm. repentance is hard because it means confronting the truth of who you are. And and I think we have that discussion in our in our in our nation right now. Like like for instance to me critical race theory is an invitation to repentance. It's an invitation to this country to see the truth of who we really are. But we don't want to see that truth because it means that we can't hold this false sense of ourselves together. If everything that that critical race theory says is true, then everything that I've come to understand about America as being the land of the free is false. And, and yet it's only by confronting that truth of our existence as a settler colonial nation that we can repent mm -hmm. and come to become and come to live into the possibility of being a land of free people. Right. And I think that's exactly why we're so bad at chronic kindness, chronic hospitality, because to be good at chronic hospitality, chronic kindness, we have to acknowledge that there's something chronically wrong. Acute kindness is easy because acute problems are beyond our control. Natural disasters happen. Terrorist attacks happen. Those are beyond our control. We handle them in the moment. We go back to quote unquote normal None of that is our fault. When there's something chronic, it's because it's our fault. We were doing something wrong to begin with. Mm. And, and in order to address that, we have to repent. We have to acknowledge the wrong we were doing. Um, oh, yeah. Which, I sorry, the, the more I think about the acute versus chronic thing, the more I feel like you like per perfectly encapsulate sort of the awkwardness that was when people thought they were going to toilet paper and Tiger King their way through uh, be not being racist. Um, <laughs> like, you know, like, like, not to, to go down that rabbit hole too much, but like, that is that was the genuine, like, you know, response from good white people, uh, you know, quote, 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 it was like, you know, oh, well, uh, you know, let's let's fix this, you know, and it's like, no, we can't it acute versus chronic, like, this is chronic problem. We can have one diversity day and that's enough. Yeah, no, no, this is, right. this is, this isn't, this is an on, ongoing project, but I right. also, it's like, yeah, we, oh, sorry, you go. <laughs> we, 
Like, we, we can't just have February full of mm-hmm. companies talking about how we need to work to make the world better for Black people and then go back to being normal the rest of the year. Mm-hmm. We can't just have June full of companies talking about how we need to make the world better for queer people and then go back to normal for the rest of the year. Which, um, going circling back to the show, um, I think it's interesting. Well, first of all, I love I love the the like the diversity in casting, like the different ages, uh, you know, different racial representation, uh, you know, and and all that. But then also like, oh man, the I don't remember I don't remember the the Muslim character's name, but um, yeah, that how did that. Like, I thought that plot line, like, it just very much just showed, like, these are the things that happened. <laughs> you know, these are the things that mm-hmm. happened to him. And, you know, and he did get to, you know, they he did get that support in, in being able to, like, show his skills in the kitchen. And, but then, you know, he also had to get strip sh- searched flying back and, like, all of the shit that he went through. Um, I think was handled in a way that was like, <laughs> this is what happened. <laughs> you know? My, um, when, uh, the, yeah. uh, we often talk about where how we remember where we were on September 11th. Well, where I was on September 11th was in debate class. And uh, being a white cisgendered male, my first instinct was patriotic and nationalist and that sort of thing. But um, one of the African-American students who was standing next to me sighed and said, boy, I'd hate to be an Arab American and right now. Mm. Initial response was anger. My initial response was, how can you think of race at a time like this? It's like, well, because it's a racial issue. Yeah. Because it's a political issue. Mm-hmm. Driven by fear. Yeah. You know, I mean, and I think they make that, ele- I, I like that they include that element of the story of the, in in that moment, yes, but just in general, the, fear of not knowing and that was the thing that resonated for me so much in especially in the first half where there was so much of like oh my gosh we got diverted but we don't know why they didn't have all the connections back home with cell phones or news 24 or 7 on their phones like we have now you know and just trying to make sense of this crazy situation yeah and that that driving chorus of i need something to do because i can't watch the news anymore (laughs) Um. Well, Mom, we, we've talked every so often, we talk about the experience of September 11th, because I was in seventh grade, and you were a serving minister at a thousand plus member church. Um, <laughs> what was the, what was your day like? Mm-hmm. Well, I went into work. I didn't know what had happened because I hadn't had the TV on and I went into work and got these really confused. I was serving a church in Fremont, Nebraska and um, had was got all these really confusing stories about what was going on and then got told sort of what was going on and then was told I still had to go up to this really small church in this really small town and sit in the church office in case anybody came in and needed anything. I'd go up there and sit by myself where there was no TV, no radio, no nothing, and got sent out on the road to drive up the highway to go. And I'm, of course, listening to the radio. And the I think it was the plane that hit the Pentagon. I was driving up the road and heard that and just pulled over to the side of the road and just sobbed. And then I went on up and sat in the church office. And I thought, I can't sit here anymore. I can't sit here not knowing what's going on. And but I knew I couldn't go back home because the senior pastor wouldn't let me go home. I I, all I wanted to do was be home where my kids were. So I went to the nursing home and found a church member who had the radio, the TV on and sat there with her. It still kind of chokes me up, (laughs) sat there with her and watched with her what was going on so I knew what was happening um and she had somebody to sit there with and watch too and that's what I did that day um 
It was a really, really odd day. And then that night, there were church services in that same small town, but there were church services in Fremont too. And so the senior pastor and the other associate went up to that small town and left me in Fremont to go to the community church service. And I remember that my my passage to read in that community church service was the Micah passage about turning your uh, swords into plowshares. And that was what I had to read. That, that's the one that I read. And it, that was a very important passage to me. And um, so those are my memories of that day. And that makes me think of the, um, the African couple in the, in the show on the mm. bus going to the Salvation Army encampment. And they have no way of communicating. And the, guy, the bus driver realizes that they're freaked out and I don't know if he figured out that it was because of the uniforms or not, because the National Guard, the, the Salvation Army, put all, all the people put on their uniforms. And the people, the, these people from Africa, the last time they, the last experience they had with being bused anywhere, bused to a camp and everybody there in uniforms was African Civil War setting death camps. So they were freaked out. So this bus driver realized they were clutching Bibles and remembered the bus, the Bible verse. And I don't remember which Bible verse it was, uh, if anybody does. Yeah, Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious yeah. for nothing. And that's how we started speaking the same language. Dear listeners, today we speak of cash. For money makes our world spin like a top. It's true, without it all doth bang and clash. Though surely I wish not appear a pop. New faith, new media asks all who loves us and wish to enrich our world of wonder to please grant us just a humble few cents. Your kind gifts will lift us ever farther. A website on yonder server is born, a kind forum full of brightest discourse, and mostly free from all trolls and vile scorn, where we follow conversation's course. So please, to your podcasters, toss some coins, if you have enjoyed hearing our rejoins. All of this is to say, our Indiegogo campaign is ongoing, and we would appreciate any donation you would be so generous as to make. Thank you very much. Oh, we could talk a lot yeah. about the theology in Philippians 4, too. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> well, it's it's Stoic. It's it's St. Paul directly taking from this sense of Stoic to, of, of Stoicism, which is a Greek um, a, a, a Greek philosophy that's very similar to Buddhism in its sense of detachment. Like you detach your things from the, you detach yourself from the things that you're that that, that you're afraid to lose. What what Yoda says to Luke of let go of the things you are afraid to lose. And um, uh, yeah, so we, we could spend a whole episode talking about that. <laughs> that might have been a tangent. Hmm. <laughs> but the prepare for the prepare for the worst. If the worst happens, you're prepared. If it doesn't happen, you're pleasantly surprised. Well, it, that that's the one scene that that was a scene that made me because um, because I it's interesting the spirit in which the bus driver the the spirit that the bus driver intended to convey was probably not the spirit that Saint Paul was intending to convey in Philippians four, but it's. Um, it, it, that's one of the moments that chokes me up because essentially he was telling them, don't be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. Yeah. And that, that, that mm -hmm. makes me cry as I'm sitting mm -hmm. here thinking about it. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But like the, uh, imagine if he'd done the, uh, from the nativity, fear not for I bring you great tidings of good, good tidings of great joy, but that wouldn't have fit because terrorist attack war is about to break out but that would be the one that i would have known off the top of my head so be not afraid i go before you always come follow me there's a catholic hymn that's oh, one yeah. of those new catholic hymns oh yeah 
Be not afraid. Yeah. I go before you always. Come follow me and I will give you rest. Which takes to, which brings together okay. all different I love that passages. one. <laughs> it's not it's not it's not a single passage of scripture. It pulls together different verses. So, yeah. so uh going back to the Kevins. Yes, let's talk about the Kevins. I want to talk about the philosophy of Kevins because they both each Kevin uh of the of this power couple Kevin and Kevin. It was cute for a while. Uh, one, um, they both have different reactions. And what I think is interesting, uh, as I no I noticed this my most recent uh, run through of it, is that um, they almost represent the different sides of, or the uh, different sides of how to react to a crisis. Um, right. Yes. Yeah. We talked about that too. Yeah. Yeah, so we have the Kevin who is who wants to just like uh, get to know the community, explore, feel his feelings, and then we have uh, let's say it's lumberjack Kevin and sassy Kevin. But sassy Kevin is right. just like I'm, I I don't like this. They eat rainbows for breakfast here. I'm over it. I'm over it. I'm over it. I need to go home. I need uh, to see my sister. I just like, want to lay down. I just mm -hmm. want to lay down. Well, one Kevin yeah, was right. from LA and one Kevin was from New York too. So hmm. historically, I mean, they were both from LA at the time, but, but, you know, one Kevin's hometown was New York. True. And I think that made a big difference to, to, to that Kevin. Yeah. He, he was more deeply tied to New York than he thought he was too. Um, because mm -hmm. he he in the end ended up going back to New York, right, so right. I think it affected him but a lot the, more more than he thought it was going to. Yeah, and and I think L.A. But, Kevin was like did did not know how to hold that. Right. Um, but the the other thing we talked about a bit was that um, of the of the four people that kissed the fish. There was L.A. Kevin, there was Texas, Texas chick, there mm -hmm. was a uh, London guy, and, and there was the other New York boy, the one who was so freaked out that they're so trusting, so hospitable. Like, you're just letting me take your, your grill? You're giving me tea as I'm coming and taking your grill? Uh, I, you're, I don't have to worry about my wallet? I can just leave it on the dresser while I'm taking a shower in your, in your guest bedroom bathroom? Um, but he, the, and the kissing the fish was becoming an honorary Newfoundlander, that ceremony, that, and that was very much a, uh, I'm forgetting what play this is from, the eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, that we've done everything we can, we have no power to make the situation better, we are humans facing, we are humans facing the unknown, we are surrounded by raging chaos and darkness. So what do we do? We throw a party. And we go have a beer. And those four people, those four characters who kissed the fish, who went the, through the ceremony of becoming the honorary Newfoundlanders, were the four people from the plane who embraced it, who embraced that action, that core, that core humanity of partying in the face of tragedy hmm. and that was one of the kevins the la kevin and the other kevin was the one who wanted to cry and, and shriek and tear rend his crying and wailing and gnashing of teeth kevin uh what versus eat drink and be merry for tomorrow we die kevin so should we talk about the um British slash Texan couple. <laughs> they make me so happy. <laughs> me too. <laughs> well, and I think it's appropriate that we do after we've just talked about it, I think there's a foil there of, you know, it splits the two Kevins apart. It brings these two characters together. Um even even if just for a time, because they kind of realize, oh, we have to go back to the real world. <laughs> Well, indeed, they, they got married. Yeah, they they, they got. I, I actually watched that bat bit of background. They got married. The real couple. Yeah, they, they we did. couldn't handle a long distance relationship, so I moved to Texas. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, I loved that. Well, and my first thought when we got introduced to him was, well, and I don't have my meds with me. They're in my chucked bag. And I'm looking at him going, idiot, you always have your meds in your carry-on. And then I had that moment of, oh, we learned that because of 9-11, didn't we? (laughs) (laughs) As someone who has like five five to five minimum daily meds I have to get a take to function. I know that about travel, but I know that because of September 11th. That was the demarcation of shift in travel. Before that, you put your meds in your checked bag. So anyway, onward with the couple talk. But yes, they're very cute. Um, (laughs) Go on. That's all I got. They're very yeah. cute. Well, no, I don't uh, think they would have ever gotten together if they hadn't had that experience, though, because mm-hmm. they both were not the type of people that would have ever been bold enough to have made that foray into a relationship like that because of their past experiences. And being mm-hmm. able to be in that village and have that time together, it, it gave them the opportunity to be in a place that was safe. Yeah. Yeah, and and that points at the overall like uh like through line of this uh, realization of all that was gained on top of all that was lost and like being able to hold all of that. Honestly, I think the more meaning the most meaningful character, well, I'm not sure how to put that, but the, my my mind first went to the Texan slash uh, English couple, and yeah, that's that's fine. Um, but it's interesting that that the the one that I think really and it isn't resonated so much as I thought I found heartbreaking was uh, the the woman whose son was a firefighter. Yeah, yeah, yeah that that mm-hmm. broke my heart. And who she called was the the woman from Gander to tell her. Hmm. Yes. The, the woman, the woman from Gander, whose son was a firefighter. Mm. And the, that, that conversation that they had, the, the woman from Gander who said, there's nothing I can say to help you. There's nothing I can do to help you, but I can tell you some dumb jokes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love their, their friendship is just absolutely beautiful um and also yeah it's heartbreaking um firefighters have always held a special place in my heart because um you can politicize firefighting you can politicize anything but uh, it's very easy to politicize police work especially now nowadays but it's a little bit harder to politicize firefighting because and they are the epitome of what saint fred rogers yes saint Fred Rogers would call the helpers that you know, look for the helpers. Right. Well, there they are. Their, their job is to run into a burning building and save people. That's their job. And it's like, good mm-hmm. God. And, and, and the second most people that were killed on September 11th, the second most type of people were New York City firefighters, the first being uh, Port Authority police officers. And it's like, wow. Mm-hmm. And the, I remember mom and I again we live together we want we spend a lot of time together so a lot of my stories have mom in them but the uh the uh at one point we were I don't remember which show it was we were watching if it was NCIS or Bones or something and it was this it was one of the cold opens and these two boys were had gotten up early to go make some mischief and they were they were trying to hype each other and themselves up and it was and it was kind of cute because very obviously they were young boys who weren't actually troublemakers and they were try they were both posing for each other and then there was a car and they were in their cul-de-sac in some suburban neighborhood and some and then there was a car crash down the street and they they locked eyes and immediately go running to the car crash and it was that mu- and like that facade of being troublemakers just fell away and it was that moment of character of something goes wrong and they run to the trouble to help not to gawk not to make the help not to make the trouble worse 
but running to the trouble to help. And it's it's just a, a reflection of character. And there were that was there were that, that that kind of shining moment of character was reflected many times in this musical. And like one that really got me was the lady from the ISPCA. She's my favorite. That, <laughs> Like, and I kept going, why is she the ASPCA? Why isn't she the Canadians? Why isn't she the CSPCA, the Canadian? And then I was like, oh, yeah, a lot of times they just use American for North American. The Canadians find it weird that we call ourselves Americans because we're in the USA. And that's like, why do we identify as a continent hmm. instead of our country? Uh, anyway, but the, like she she was like, I don't care what the TSA says. I don't care what the army says. I am going in there. I am climbing around. I don't I am I am going to find the dogs and the cats and oh chimpanzees. Okay. And I, <laughs> I'm going to make sure they're fed. I'm going to make sure they have water. I'm going to clean up their poo. I'm going to give, give the ones that have medicines, make sure they get their medicines. You can shoot me if you want but you're going to have to have on your conscience that you shot somebody trying to feed puppies. And it was that, it was a, it was a shining moment of character. You know, it took me the longest time to realize that was the same person as the pilot. Oh no, that's a different, uh, Oh yeah. Uh, Wasn't it the same? Um, no, it's, it's, it's a different woman. I just swear it was the same person. Um, her. I thought it was the same actress too. Yeah, in the version we saw, I think it was the oh, same maybe. person because she put a jacket on and then went over. It. But it didn't happen for the longest time that you saw them put the jacket on and off. Uh, we watched the same versions. <laughs> I would like to talk about the pilot. Yes, because that sense of of longing to soar, mm -hmm. longing to do the um, the impossible and to to do what others tell you you can't do. Yep. Mm. yeah yes her her character is just fantastic and i have such a soft spot for that opening number because one of the hills that i will die on is that there are not enough musical numbers for women uh in above 30 who are singing about their career or what their dreams are after they figured out their happily ever after stuff. Like, mm -hmm. there, there, there are not enough of that. Right. And what I love about that song is it is her whole career and like everything that has added up. And I also love the, just that this is, again, these are all real people. And so I love that that play actually amplified her story. And the real Beverly Bass now has a children's book entitled Me in the Sky. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and Jen Collette and Beverly Bass are friends. And that makes me happy. But, um, <laughs> but yes, that, that, that having that as this sort of this is what I wanted number. It's not an I want number um, is just... I, uh, it's so beautiful. It's such a beautiful song and it's so musically the way it's set up is just, I love it so much. <laughs> yeah. Um, just that, that the one thing I loved more than anything was used as the bomb. Yeah. And I, I loved that, that she talked about that her first job flying was getting a little prop, a little like one propeller plane that was her in the front and then a coffin. And she would go get people who died far away from where they were being buried. And she'd load the coffin in the back, then she'd have to climb over the coffin and fly it. She never talked about creep being creeped out. It was just her job. And like, I've I mean, I grew up with pastors. I grew up that one of the first people we met every time we moved to a new town was the people who funeral ran the funeral home. Yep. <laughs> yeah. The, the, and the, that, uh, like, that oftentimes, like the the body would get would get dropped off at the church the night before a funeral, and we'd have to go check on it. And 
and we'd go with the we'd go with our parents to make sure that the church was locked up and that the and it was just death happens we were okay with it and that it was she had a very it was it was one line but the way she delivered it had that to it mm. but in that same her story also had that she didn't she knew when she found out what had happened she knew that one of her friends that she'd just been having coffee or dinner or drinks or something with in london was heading to new york and she didn't know what had happened to him mm. so there was that that back and forth that contrast of she knew death happens she's okay with it she's flown bodies around she's climbed over coffins to get to her seat so she could fly her little prop job and she's okay with that with she doesn't know if her friend that she just had this meal with is alive or not and it turns out he wasn't he was on one of the planes or he was he a was pilot, pilot too. for one of the planes yeah he was a pilot yeah and then so it was that contrast, I think, was very well done. Um, now, the part, uh, now I'm thinking of the part that, uh, one of the parts that makes me choke up is the, uh, when I, when she sings to her husband at the very end of it, the I'm fine, Tom, I'm fine, like, and that repetition of that, and, like, she's, like, saying that through tears, and I'm just like, ah! Um... One yeah. thing that I learned from being a chaplain at KU Hospital, and I imagine that Pastor Michelle might have something to say about this too, is that when someone says you're fi they're fine, they're not fine. Like fine mm -hmm. means the opposite <laughs> of fine. Feelings and turn her eyes never expressed. <laughs> mm -hmm. Whoa. Yeah. And and the fact that she she's offered to take time off, but she doesn't. I I would be more concerned about that. Yeah. You know. That she just kind of goes right back to it. It's like, no, take time to process this. Well, and so I don't know how real this is, but so many times I see pilots portrayed that they fly giant 747s or whatever, and then they have their own little plane, their own little job or or seaplane or whatever i can see her needing to fly that the traumatic event for her was being grounded there's also but, truth in the claim that some people process through working it's mm -hmm. like we often say you need to That's take true. time to process well you need to not work you need to go and rest well some people find their work relaxing and some people process by going to work and by you know yeah. being productive that's fair it's me i'm people <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well and, and i think that yeah. for me i resonated with that a little bit when she was talking about planes not being mm -hmm. designed to yeah. just be idle to sit you know and, right. and to me and it's like asshole. she's talking about her <laughs> yeah right and that the as like what they were talking about is that the asphalt the that the runways were built are made out of is not a true solid it is a very slow moving liquid it's a the pitch drop experiment is pitch is asphalt um and planes are very large very heavy machines so if you sit them on asphalt it's not like a car sitting so they were talking about the fact that the, the wheels were starting to sink into the asphalt. And if they didn't get them moving, they weren't going to move. And the hurricane was coming. And if they didn't get the, the planes gone before the hurricane hit, they were going to be destroyed. And this This is not something that I necessarily agree with, but I'll give voice to it. It's this notion that machines are characters planes are characters cars are characters and and we often personalize machines but actually if you think about it um what are human beings and what are living beings but cellular machines the the difference is is that one is carbon based and the other is silicon based i, I think the the real in a philosophical sense difference is, is that persons which can be human or other species are able to reflect Get on out. the act of thinking Sorry. but uh the, the the we often make 
characters and persons out of the machines that we use, be they an airplane. I mean, pilots do this all the time. They, they talk about their plane as if it was a she. Uh, captains of a ship, the she, the ship get, got me through it and, and takes on a life of their own. And I wonder what we think about that in, in, in this milieu. Hmm. Well, like all my computers are named. Um, I mean, not this one because I named it and then probably forgot the name, but uh, my old computer is Shoba. My drawing pad is um, Sephora, my um, so on and so forth. Well, the um, I personalize things and talk to them. It's part of how I, I deal. Like, the whole... I, I even talk to the food as I'm cooking. It's so. The whole point of Battlestar Galactica is the difference between a human brain and a Cylon brain is that one is silicon based and the other is carbon based. The difference between a computer and a human being is that one is cellular and the other is not, but they both are computers. They both yeah. compute and think and and one can reflect on thinking. And I don't know, I, I heard a lot of that in Bass and Captain Bass, that the, the, the thing that I love was used as a bomb, that, that it's not just her love of flying, it's the fact that, that, that an airplane, an aircraft takes on a kind of life of its own, it's used to, 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 to carry people to and fro, but it's also the thing that gets you there. And it, it, you have to love it, you have to respect it, you have to care for it, and it takes on its own life, and you have to. If, if you forget that, then it's it's not gonna it's not gonna work for you. Mm. That line at the end of Serenity, the the Firefly movie, where Mal and um, love. <laughs> it's what keeps a. You can you can know as much as anybody, but if you don't want if you take a boat in the air that you don't love, it'll shake you off as sir is flying, I think is the line. So. Mm. So, any other bits of wisdom? I can't hold my South Park smile forever. Uh, yeah, I, <clears throat> I just... So the only other thing that I thought about, I mean, and it's not a, a major point, but the fact that we kind of start with the they're having the debate with the unions about the buses oh. and mm -hmm. and they and they're willing to say, you know, they're willing to set that aside for just just long enough to be of assistance in this case. And then they and then they go right back to the conversation later on. No union. Yeah. Well, have you heard about the, the Japanese city bus union, how they did their strike? Was that they they did their routes as normal. They interacted with the customers as normal. They did everything as normal, except they refused to collect fares. It's interesting. The, the 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment in the Civil War did the same exact thing when they learned that um, African-American soldiers were to be paid $10 a month, whereas white soldiers were to be paid $13 a month. They tore up their pay cards and refused to take payment. Oh, they still fought. Oh, they still did what they did, but, but they refused to take payment. And that, that is a very interesting means of civil disobedience. Sure, yeah, you, you, wanna, you wanna abuse us? I'll show you what that looks like. So it was the but like the uh that union rep i had so much respect for that character it was like the yes this is more important we will set this aside but our conflict is still important so we are setting it aside we are not abandoning it so that's I respected that, and that line that I messaged you guys when I still when we started watching the show. Let me scroll back to it. Um, uh, something about Tim Hortons. Um, um, 
everything centers around Tim Hortons. It begins and ends. It was uh, everything. Everything starts and ends at Tim Hortons because my my current favorite author. Um, and she's been my favorite author many times before, and I'm sure she will be again. But nobody stays my favorite author forever. Is Tanya Huff, and she's a speculative fiction author, queer as hell, um, lives in Canada. And she always mentions Tim Hortons because it's a Canadian institution. So, like the like the book I'm listening to of hers now, it's like they're um, the the wizard and he's learning how to be a wizard and every time he screws up a, a spell he basically burns all of his fat reserves so he screws up a spell and they immediately have to take him to whatever drive through is open and get him food or he'll go into he'll go into shock because he has no calories left and usually middle of the night Canada what's open is tim hortons so it's like get him crappy coffee and donuts <laughs> so. there is one more line that we must speak of and reflect upon and it is simply this that there's a moose <laughs> that there's a moose uh no, moose when, when she wants to when she's good and ready <laughs> yeah. um I yeah. I have a line that oh, I wanted. What was that conversation, Mom? That I stopped and rewound because I couldn't hear. It was the it was the 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 kid who was staying with the mayor, the one who could not believe that the uh, that he could just leave his wallet, that he could just get take people's grills, and it was the uh, thank you so much for taking care of us. You would have done the same. I drank all your Irish whiskey. I would have, I done, would have the done the same. same. <laughs> I loved that. <laughs> All right, Gail, your turn. Yes, I was going to say, as far as lines to reflect on in a more serious point, and this might also, I might also save this for my, my, uh, uh, what would you make a sermon about? But it's the you are here. So, Gail, if you were writing a sermon yes. on this on this <laughs> uh, 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 f uh, musical, what what would the takeaway be for the congregation? So, I would title it either "You Are Here" or "Can You Make a Musical About Giving People Sandwiches and a Hug?" Um, and I would either explore the um, the "You Are Here." Uh, if I if I went the "You Are Here" route, I'd be exploring like the different ways people react in crisis moments when you realize like you are here you are suddenly pulled to the present to this moment and and have to just sort of process this gigantic change that you've been thrown into um and if it was called how can you write a musical about giving people sandwiches and a hug i'd probably just info dump about this musical i'd probably do both so it's okay to be here and not there yeah Yes. Mm. Yeah, that was the that was the one that got me. That was the, the the you are we are here. I am here. I should be there. That theme started with the woman whose son was a New York City firefighter, right? And she was feeling such prof she was feeling such profound guilt that she was not in New York City. Um. And like, it was nobody said it to her. And if they had, nobody could. She wouldn't have heard it. She couldn't have understood it. But there was no way she could have gotten there. And they needed people to not be there. They needed as many people not there as could be. Um, That's the, the best thing she could do was to not be there. So. We we missed a line that we have to reflect on. For the love of God, stop sending toilet paper to the Lions Club. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 you made me think of that. Like, so, um, all all of the above, you know. And 
you know, thinking about what the ways that we respond and maybe sometimes respond in ways that are not so helpful, <laughs> that are almost overwhelming. Um, if I were to preach on this, I would probably, the, the story of the Good Samaritan kind of comes to mind. Um, it's a little simplistic and I would want to talk about this of, um, you know, the, the Samaritan is not just a friendly, cozy person that we welcome. We are welcoming a complete and total stranger. And so I think I would center that around the, the hotelier chef Muslim man and, and what he experiences in the midst of that. Because one time I heard a really good interpretation of the story of the Good Samaritan should be for us, maybe the good Muslim might help us to, mm -hmm. to rethink that story and the, and the punch that it should have. So um, that's what I would, some thoughts I have for preaching about it. I don't know how helpful this would be to the mother, but it's, it's helpful to me. Um, and maybe this is my ego and God forgive me for it, but, um, your son saved the lives of 49,000 people because at any given moment in the world trade center during the day, there could be 50,000 people in the world trade center at any given moment. And the number of people who died was just shy of 2000 people. And that's horrible and that's tragic and terrific. However, that means that 49,000 people got out because people like your son, New York City firefighters and Port of Florida police officers and et cetera, did their jobs and did them well. That was the victory. Mm -hmm. They got them out. Mm. So mom, what would you, if you were going to get back in the pulpit for a day and write a sermon about this movie, what would you write about? I would probably write about um, the what what changes and what moves here and what moves there the the whole changing the scene and all of that but I wouldn't preach so <laughs> <laughs> So Wesley, what would you preach about? <laughs> um, well, one of the, like one of the things that got me was I was wondering, and they didn't explain it until like a third of or a halfway through, was why did they have an airport that could that could handle, what was it, one hundred and twenty nine planes? Thirty nine. Thirty nine planes. Transatlantic planes, and they explore thirty. 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, 39, so, so planes from all over North America would fly to Newfoundland, refuel in Gander at that airport, and then fly over. And in Europe, they would fly from all over Europe to Spain or Portugal, right on the tip of the Iberian Peninsula, refuel and fly to Newfoundland. So it, you, that used to be the international hub. That used to be their big, the big source of income, the big industrial source for gander and they talk about it about halfway through the movie that like when the beatles first came to north america their first place they set foot on north america was in gander and that every so often they talk about well we don't use this airport anymore because they uh we don't it's technology has changed they don't need to stop and refuel you can get an international flight from anywhere to anywhere. Like when I went to study in Berlin for a semester, we flew directly from Omaha to Berlin, flew from the middle of a continent to the middle of another continent. Um, <clears throat> but that one of the things that got me was every so often there were these moments of 
I'm old, I am the world has passed me by, I don't matter anymore. But then there were the this situation that nobody could have predicted and things were relevant again. Um, Gander was suddenly relevant for 39 planes for 7,000 people. It needed a place to stop and wait. Um, the mayor of this little town, the mayor of a 7,000 person town is a part-time job at best, but he had to organize a where to put these 7,000 people, how to feed them, how to keep them clean, how to keep them healthy, uh, so on and so forth. So. It doesn't matter whether we can do it, we have to do it. It's something that I don't remember which exactly. one of you said it. And if I was to preach a sermon, yeah. I think that would be where it would center on. And it's the notion that, look, yeah. not I, I, I'm, I don't get paid for being a priest, so um, I, I get paid for being an insurance agent. And one of the things that I tell my other agents is, is don't worry about how many sales you make, just do right by your customer and you'll get sales. And if you don't, well, mm -hmm. fine. But uh, the, what I mean by that is this, is look, um, just do right. Like stand to your post, stand to your duties. And I, and I, I preached a sermon on this at the, begin, the very beginning of uh, COVID. It's like, stand to your duties. Don't be afraid. Stand, do, what you, do what you are called to do and, and good will come. And, and, and you'll, you'll, right. you, what, 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 don't worry about the end game, just do your duty and let the, leave the rest in the hands of the divine and, and, and what good will come will come. And, and at the end of the day, you may not be able to take on the totality of what you are experiencing, but do your duty and you'll at least do some good. So I guess that's the sermon I preach. And uh, <laughs> and mom and I were also listening to what the audiobook Wonder. I forgot the author, but uh, the end the end of it there. Um, the author puts all the quotes that inspired. Uh, I don't remember. I don't even remember if it's a male or female, but it includes the John Wesley's rule. So yeah. tossing it to mom again because. <laughs> What do all the good you can for all the people you can in all the ways you can at all the times you can, blah, 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 blah. Yep. Yeah. So the, the, the Wesleyan creed, the Methodist, the, you know, for as long as you, in all the places you can, for as long as you can. Yeah. And from a human, from my humanist perspective, it's the, you do as long as you do as you do your role as long as you can when you get tired you tap out you trust that the person on your left and you and your right will do their role you trust that when you're tired and you have to tap out someone will take over for you so you're muted andrew Okay. <laughs> the outro. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today on a, uh, uh, what, did, what did we say? Two pastors. Two a pastors, priest, a priest, and a couple of Unitarians. Unitarians walk, walking into a, a musical theater. Um, we are a production of New Faith, New Media, which is doing some really incredible things to bring faith and meaning to life wherever we may, um, thanks to the work of my colleagues, Gail and, and Wesley and Andrew. Um, we are so excited to have our guest with us today as well. Thanks for joining us, Lori. And um, the right now we uh, are working on building our website so that we can continue these conversations in a forum that is a little um, higher level of conversation than you can get on the normal socials that um, we're hoping to have and so if you can support us by participating in our indiegogo campaign even if you cannot give financially, we are so grateful if you can share, give a review, like, comment, subscribe on our podcast. Um, the word of mouth and the building of the community is so important, um, whether it's through the Indiegogo or on our Patreon account as well. So we are so grateful that you have joined us today and we look forward to seeing you again when we walk into a movie theater. So 
thank you so much. Yeah, there's a moose. <laughs>